Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Amy Beatty, and I am a health transformation consultant for The Health Plan. There are several types of depression, but our time together today is going to focus on clinical depression, also known as major depression, which is likely what comes to mind for most of us when thinking about someone who is depressed. There are going to be four core areas that we will explore today. I'm going to introduce the mental health continuum, provide an overview of clinical depression. We will have an interactive part of the webinar for those interested in completing the PHQ-9 self-screening questionnaire. So keep a pen and paper nearby, and then we will end with some treatment options and what I hope are some helpful ideas that you can start today. Before I share some basic information about clinical depression, I want to start from a place of how we think about mental health, because there is still such a stigma associated with it. When you hear mental health, what comes to mind? If you are like most people, your brain jumps to the place of something is wrong. But did you know that we all have mental health? This is the mental health continuum, continuum model. We all have our own baseline of mental health and we move up and down this continuum depending on a whole host of internal and external factors in our lives. Thriving is on the far left of the continuum where we are functioning in an optimal way, kind of like being well, feeling good and having things go in a positive direction for us. Next level is surviving. You may notice feeling off. When we are surviving, we are not functioning at our optimal level, but the distress is reversible and could be more situational in nature. Moving further to the right is struggling. This is where we start to see more severe symptoms and they are impacting our overall functioning. And at the far right of the continuum, we have in crisis. This is disabling illness that requires medical care and ongoing support. Take a moment to review where you would place yourself on the continuum today. Feel free to pause the video to give yourself some additional time. It's important to remember that we move back and forth on this continuum. So if you currently find yourself in an area that you are not comfortable with, there is always the potential to return to a healthier range of mental health. And there are things that you can do to help keep you in the healthier range of the continuum, which we will get to later in the webinar. Clinical depression is a mental health disorder that is characterized by a sad, empty, hopeless or helpless mood that is present almost every day and lasts most of the day for at least two weeks. Someone who is depressed may also be experiencing a loss of interest or pleasure in activities, loss of energy, sleep issues, changes in appetite, difficulty concentrating, feelings of worthlessness and or irritability. Everyone feels sad or anxious from time to time. However, the feelings associated with depression are far more intense and longer lasting than the ups and downs of everyday life. The symptoms of clinical depression must cause clinically significant distress or impairment in day-to-day -day activities with family, school, work, or in other social situations. Depression can also be associated with thoughts of suicide. So it is important to take this seriously and find the courage to seek out support. The most recent data is from 2021 on how common is depression. Depression is the most common mental health disorder affecting 21 million American adults, which is almost 8.3% of the adult population. Clinical depression is higher among adult females at the rate of 10.3% compared to 6.2% of males. 
Keep in mind that clinical depression in males is likely underreported, and they may present with more anger, irritability, including violence at times, so the depression diagnosis is missed. Adults aged 18 to 25 have the highest prevalence. There's also a sharp rise in adolescent depression over the past 10 years. And the National Institute of Mental Health reports that about 5 million, or 20.1%, aged 12 to 17, have at least have had at least one major depressive episode within the past 12 months. Depression is the leading cause of disability for ages 15 through 44. And one last thing I want to mention is approximately 39% of adults and 59.4% of adolescents with a major dep depressive episode do not receive treatment in the past year, which means there is a lot of suffering because clinical depression is treatable. There isn't a single cause of depression. So let's look at a few that have been identified. Depression can stem from a genetic predisposition, meaning it often runs in families. While depression isn't a regular response to stressful events, major life events, for example, someone undergoing a major life change or a life crisis, like losing a job, retirement, experiencing relationship issues or divorce, may experience depression. For some, what we would think of as a positive event, like a new job or getting married, could also lead to depression. We do have to be mindful that sometimes we assume that someone is depressed when it may be a natural part of grieving a loss. The trick here is that grief from loss does increase the individual's vulnerability to depression but the care and support of the individual would be approached differently. Experiencing trauma early in life can have long-term effects on how the brain responds to fear and stress, which can increase a person's vulnerability to depression. Nearly one third of people with clinical depression also misuse drugs and alcohol. Often the depression comes first. Other medical conditions that are the final causal area that I will mention today include people who experience sleep disturbances, chronic pain, ADHD, and organic changes to the brain from medical conditions like dementia may be more likely to develop depression. There are also some medical illnesses like diabetes, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, and vitamin D deficiency that can mimic a depressive disorder. And there are a handful of medications that can cause symptoms of depression. So it is important for the person to talk to their doctor, carefully consider their medical history and the results of a physical exam to help determine the best course of treatment. I'm not going to read all these symptoms, but as you scan down the list, you can see that there are several symptoms that contribute to a clinical depression diagnosis. Bear in mind, depression might look differently across the lifespan and within different cultures. And this needs to be taken into consideration when we are looking to understand depression in ourselves or others. Men living with depression often experience tiredness, irritability, and anger. Men also misuse drugs and alcohol or engage in reckless behavior. Women living with depression often experience sadness, worthlessness, and guilt. Teenagers living with depression are often irritable, sulky, or withdrawn, and may get into trouble at school. They also may have co-occurring anxiety, eating disorders, or issues with substance misuse. Younger children living with depression often experience irritability and may refuse to go to school, and sometimes anxiety is noticeable when separated from a parent. It's worth repeating that depression is not just sadness. 
And it is important to explore what is underneath the symptoms through the lens of the person's cultural values and beliefs. I do want to briefly touch on death by suicide, which is the 11th leading cause of death in the United States, and it's preventable. As you can see from the graphic that uses data from the Center for Disease Control, the numbers are staggering. 13.2 million adults had serious thoughts of suicides and 1.6 million attempted suicide in 2022. There are over 48,100 deaths by suicide in the United States per year, which means approximately 132 people each day take their own life. Someone may make an active statement saying something like, I'm going to end my life. But equally important are the passive statements like, I just wish this could all be over, or this life isn't even worth it. Any statement should be clarified and then taken seriously since they do not speak for a certain desire or wish for death. Most people do not want to die by suicide. They want their pain and suffering to stop. One way to think about suicide is that it is the most extreme option taken to get rid of something that seems intolerable. And that something, whether it be feelings, circumstances, poor self-worth, or something else, will depend on the person. Let's briefly touch on the risk factors and warning signs. Risk factors are determined through unbiased research. They are often distant in time and unchangeable. They may mean nothing, but with that being said, risk factors make the warning signs more serious. Risk factors include family history, previous attempts, so social isolation, economic hardship, history of mental health problems, including depression, AODA. Keep in mind that one person's risk factors may be a source of relief for another. For example, divorce may be devastating for one person, but for another, a relief and an opportunity to live differently. So we can't assume how someone is feeling and cannot gauge how we feel based on someone else. Warning signs are observ observable and current. They are the behavioral signs of precipitating conditions. Warning signs include talking about or threatening suicide, looking for means to harm oneself, sudden changes in behavior or mood, especially following a painful loss or event, showing rage or talking about seeking revenge, withdrawing or isolating, hopelessness, anxiety, anxiety, insomnia, despair, feeling like a burden to others or feeling trapped, like there is no way out, no reason for living, no sense or purpose in life. Depression you can tolerate for a time, but hopelessness is difficult to tolerate. It becomes unbearable which is a plug for seeking help if you think you are living with depression. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available for immediate support by calling 1-800-272-83, oh, excuse me, 1-800-273-8255. Again, that's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, one 800 273 8255. Sometimes when we hear information about depression, it's hard to know where we personally fall within the range of severity. If you do not have a pen and paper handy, pause here so that you can get them. And if you are, are, are as bad at math as I am, and you find that your mental space is currently limited, there is absolutely no, no shame in having a calculator nearby as well, so that when we tally up our numbers at the end, you are ready. The patient health questionnaire, also known as the PHQ 
nine, which we already referenced, is a heavily researched and validated nine question screening tool that is not only used in healthcare, but you can also easily find it online by searching for PHQ-9. The self-report screening helps the clinician with diagnosing depression, depression severity, and monitoring the treatment response. The intention of completing this today is not for diagnostic diagnostic purposes, and not everyone with an elevated PHQ-9 is certain to have depression, but this can be used to talk with your doctor about what may be going on for you. So if you're interested and curious about yourself, let's take the next few minutes to complete this together. And if you are not comfortable completing it, feel free to just listen to the questions or skip ahead to the treatment slide. As you think about each of the questions, think in terms of over the last two weeks. I'm going to say that again, over the last two weeks. How often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's start by having you jot down the numbers one through nine on your paper. And I'll give you a moment to do that now. Jot one through nine. Okay, I'm going to have you rate each question using the following rating scale. Zero, not at all. One, several days. Two, more than half the days. Three, nearly every day. And again, this time span is over the last two weeks. Write down the number that best matches your answer, and then we will talk about what your personal score means. I do have them included on each of the slides, so you don't need to remember them. All right, are you ready? Question one, over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by having little interest or pleasure in doing things? Again, zero, one, two, or three. Here we go, question number two. Over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by feeling like you are more down, depressed, or hopeless than you think you should be given the circumstances? Zero, one, two, or three. Question number three, over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or sleeping too much? Also consider early morning waking where you find yourself awake at three to 4 a.m., not that tired, can't fall asleep, and think unhealthy thoughts. Zero, one, two, or three. Question number four, over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by feeling tired or having little energy? Zero, one, two, or three. Question number five, over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by having a poor appetite or overeating? Think about if you have your favorite meal, would you still enjoy it? Also, consider if you have a loss of interest to drive to the basic pleasure uh, and necessity of eating. Do you find that you are surprised that you haven't really thought about being hungry all day despite not eating much? Zero, one, two, or three. Question number six, over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by feeling bad about yourself or that you are a failure or have let yourself or your family down? 
zero, one, two, or three. Question number seven. Over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by having trouble concentrating on things such as reading the newspaper or watching television? Zero, one, two, or three. Question number eight. Over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by moving or speaking so slowly that other people could have noticed or the opposite, being so fidgety or restless that you have been moving around a lot more than usual? Zero, one, two, or three. Question number nine, how often have you been bothered by having thoughts that you would be better off dead or of hurting yourself? Zero, one, two, or three. Here's a bonus question. If you checked off any problems, how difficult have these problems made it for you to do your work, take care of things at home, or get along with other people? Not difficult at all, somewhat difficult, very difficult, extremely difficult. All right, so what does this mean? To get your score, pause here and take a moment to add up the nine numbers that you have written down. On this slide, you can see the breakout of the scoring. Match your number with the score column that it falls within to see where you may currently be with depression severity, which ranges from minimal or none to severe. If you are falling in the mild to severe, it would be beneficial to share your score with your doctor to start the conversation and to discuss possible treatment options. In a little bit, I will also be sharing with you some activities that can be preventative measures to help prevent tipping into clinical depression. Also, consider your response to the bonus question. If you marked anything other than not at all difficult, that tells me that your current mood is impacting your quality of life and assessing some support may be helpful. If you have anything other than a zero for question nine, thoughts that you would be better off dead or of hurting yourself in some way, please either call your doctor or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline for immediate support. That number again is one 800 2 seven, three, eight, two, five, five. Depression is treatable. Nine, 80 to 90% of individuals seeing help respond positively to treatment. There is no one size fits all for treating clinical depression. Medication Psychotherapy, also called talk therapy, or a combination of the two are commonly used. If someone chooses to treat with medication, it's important to remember that each person reacts differently. So the prescribing healthcare professional may try different kinds and different doses before finding the most effective approach with the least number of side effects. And this takes time and patience. The healthcare professional will help determine if the person is depressed or if they are demoralized because they are going through a difficult time due to current circumstances. For some people with mild symptoms of depression, their health care professional may not prescribe medication. They may suggest initial treatment with therapy. And again, many providers will suggest a combination of medication and psychotherapy. Cognitive behavioral or CBT 
interpersonal, behavioral activation, and family-focused therapy are often used. Psychotherapy teaches individuals experiencing depression new ways of thinking and behaving that helps modify habits that may contribute to depression. Therapy offers the opportunity to understand and work through difficult relationships or situations that have an effect on a person's depression. Once the depressive symptoms are managed, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy shows great evidence that it can prevent relapsing back into depression at a similar level as medication. That being said, mindfulness is not used while depressed because it makes people feel worse. And then for individuals who do not respond to psychotherapy or medication, electroconvulsive therapy or ECT or other brain stimulation therapies may be considered. So what can we do today to possibly start mitigating symptoms of depression? If you are someone that is in the healthy range on the mental health continuum, you may be looking at these dot points through the lens of me being Captain Obvious, but hear me out. When we are not functioning at our optimal level, some of the first things that we might forget are our basic self-care activities. And as basic as these are, they are sometimes the hardest for us to do, which is why I think they are so important to share with you. So eat nutritious, brain boosting foods like fatty fish, nuts, especially walnuts, eggs, avocado, dark greens, leafy vegetables, cut out caffeine, reduce in alcohol intake, and drink more water. Sleep. Quality sleep is critical to feeling well. But if you are someone that is not sleeping and find yourself dreading bedtime and end up feeling frustrated, sometimes shifting your goal from I have to sleep to it's time for me to rest removes some of the pressure and allows for a little grace that might help you relax your body and brain. Get moving. Aim for 20 to 30 minutes most days of the week. But if you're having a hard time functioning and just getting out of bed is a victory, start with two minutes or five minutes and build from there. Check in with yourself to see how you're feeling and if you have the mental space to hold another minute. And if you do, then do it. Not to sound cliche, but the hardest part of the journey is actually the start. Create a morning routine. We are humans and we need a purpose. Even if that purpose is getting up at the same time, taking care of our personal hygiene hygiene and basic needs. Sometimes it helps to take care of something like a pet or a plant, which gives us that extra boost to keep going. Starting your day with a walk or an exercise routine can jumpstart those endorphins. Whatever it is, use your morning routine as a feel-good accomplishment because you're taking care of yourself. Isolation fuels depression. As hard as it is, because it can be hard, taking small steps to interact with friends, family, an animal, or even brief connections with strangers can help. I am intentionally repeating the mental health continuum model slide so that I can direct your attention to the bottom portion, outlining the actions and resources section. In addition to the things that I just mentioned, each area on the continuum offers suggestions. Feel free to pause the webinar to consider where you fall on the continuum and some ideas on what you can do to support your own mental health. Depression is treatable. Talk with your doctor if you have concerns about depression or where you place yourself on the mental health continuum. You are not alone. Seek support from your friends, family, or even your employee assistance program if your employer offers one. If you have thoughts that you would be better off dead, or of hurting yourself, please contact your doctor 
or call or text 988 for the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline or chat 900lifeline.org. Thank you for spending a little bit of your day with me and be well.